John writes, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only son from the father full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him and exclaimed, This was the one of whom I said, the one coming after me ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. Indeed, we have all received grace upon grace from his fullness. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the one and only Son who is himself God and is at the Father's side. He has revealed him. Amen and amen. Uh, If this is your first time joining us here at Grace Bible Church, let me give a a warm welcome uh, to you. My name is Roy. If we have not met before, I am uh, one of the pastors, as Danny said, one of the uh, elders that has the privilege of opening up um, to the gospel according to John. So if you uh, haven't opened up there yet, you have a Bible, please open up to the Gospel according uh, to John. We usually call it uh, the Gospel of John or John's Gospel, and you'll hear me refer to all three of those uh, throughout this series, but uh, if you look in your Bibles, it may say the Gospel according to John. Now, that's not uh, an inerrant, inspired um, title that, that's given. Um, that title was given after the manuscripts were sort of compiled and put together, Um, But that title, according to, does actually tell us something very important about the Gospels. Uh, And that is that we do not have four different varied versions of the Gospel. Uh, Rather, we have one Gospel, according to, four different uh, witnesses before us. So we have Matthew and uh, John, who were, in fact, eyewitnesses of these things. Mark, who got the story from Peter. uh, And Luke, who investigated these things very carefully. Now, ultimately, I don't think it matters what you call it, as long as it's, you know, John or John's gospel. Um, But all that to say is that it is one gospel story from four different perspectives. And uh, the perspective that we're looking at here this morning is, in fact, John. Now, two weeks ago, John started his glorious overture, the first 18 verses of this gospel, as uh, sort of a a prelude, a preliminary introduction to all of the major themes and illusions that we're going to see throughout the 21 chapters. So he began with that eternal word of God who never came into existence. He already was. He is eternal. He is God himself. And he has the power to create not just life, in the world, but life eternal in the soul of a human being. Last week, then, we looked at the external witness of the eternal word who came into existence at a certain point in time, the witness, that is. John the Apostle doesn't want his readers to get confused about the nature of the witness in verse 6, and so he tells us that John the Baptist is not the light. He's a messenger to the light. He points people toward the true light that was coming into the world. And today, then, we see the third installment, the third theme of this glorious overture, and that is the extraordinary revelation, uh, the revelation of who that eternal word is that this external witness was testifying to. So we have the eternal word, the external witness, and an extraordinary revelation. And it's that third one that we're going to look at here this morning, the extraordinary revelation. So before we jump into verse 14, let me just pray one last time for our time in God's Word. Well, Father, it is our deepest cry for you to glorify your name through your Son here this morning. Where else... Can we go? Where else is there to go outside of Jesus? For Jesus has the words of eternal life. Father, as we come to you with the kind of weeks that we've had, or perhaps even the life that some of us have lived in here this morning, I ask that you would show rivers of grace, and truth and glory that come through the channels of the gospel into our souls. Father, point us toward Jesus, the glorious Son of God who has come 
to die in the place of sinners. For our good and for your glory, we ask and we pray these things. Amen. Where to begin? What to say? How to say it? When to stop? How to stop? These are the very questions I found myself asking as I was coming to the closing verses of John's overture. Standing before these closing five verses is like standing on the edge of our solar system. I know all of the beauty and the wonder that I see before me and everything that I want to say, but at the same time feeling at a loss for words at how to even begin to say it. I wonder how John felt as he was writing this gospel, as he was writing these 18 verses, coming to the end of these 18 verses, did he really say enough? And so instead of attempting the impossibility of human comprehensibility, what I'm simply going to do is read our text, explain our text the best way I can, and see if we can apply the text in a meaningful way, knowing full well that by the end of this sermon, we will have just touched the very surface of verses 14 to 18 and the beauty that we see in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Incarnation's Latin word for the enfleshment of the Son of God. When God took on human flesh, he wrapped himself in human weakness and frailty. It's what we celebrate every year at the time of Christmas. And it's with great joy that I tell us, friends, that Christmas has indeed come early this morning because we are in the eternal word who has made flesh to display God's glory, grace, and truth. And so with all of that set before us, the main point that I want us to see as we come to these verses, it's a bit long, I'm sorry, but it's the best I could do. The word, of, uh, the word made flesh has come into the world to display the greater grace of the gospel given in glory, grace, and truth. The word made flesh has come into the world to display the greater grace of the gospel given in glory, grace, and truth. Two points, the word made flesh and the greater grace of the gospel. So if you are following along, please start in verse 14 with me. Let's make our way through God's holy word. John writes, The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glories of the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In his commentary on the gospel of John, J.C. Ryle comments, If we measure this by words, verse 14 is very short. If we measure it by content, verse 14 becomes very, very long. There is just so much to say in verse 14 alone, but we can't stay there. But for the first time since the opening words to his overture, John now reintroduces us to that eternal word that he first displayed to us in verses 1 and 2. And with unabashed clarity now, John unapologetically describes the word in, in such terms he describes that eternal word in such a way that was absolutely scandalous for his readers to see. Verse 14, and the word became flesh. Now, don't let that pass you by too quickly, dear friends. Those words are just as shocking today as they were back in the first century church. Uh, the word, the uncreated, the everlasting pre-existent word, he, that word, that very eternal word, took to himself that which he did not previously possess in eternity past. Uh, notice that it, it doesn't say the word assumed flesh. Uh, the word appeared to be flesh. Uh, the word put on flesh like a, like a mask. He didn't masquerade around as flesh. He literally became flesh. That is, without ceasing to be God, the word added to his deity that which he did not possess in eternity. Remaining what he was, he became what he was not. 
So that nothing that is true of him in verse 1 ceases to be true of him in verse 14. Deity was not subtracted from him. Humanity was added to him. Flesh. And those four words, the word became flesh. That is the hinge you see upon which all of Christianity stands or falls. Because without those four words, Christianity ceases to be Christian. Without those four words, Christianity ceases to be good news for the weary because every other religion teaches us, dear friends, that man must make his way up to God. Man must be good enough. He must do something in order to to merit the favor of God and to get into God's good graces, whereas Christianity says God comes down to us. He takes on human flesh in loving pursuit of his matchless bride. The word becomes flesh. It's interesting that John could have used a number of other Greek terms to describe this incarnation. Uh, He could have said that the word became soma. That is, soma is the Greek word for body. The the word simply put on a body. Uh, He could have said anthropos. The word became an anthropos, a man or humanity. That is, hair and teeth and legs and all of those things, the physical qualities, all of which are absolutely true, but not the point John wants us to see. See, John uses the very provocative term, almost crude expression for the term, which is sarks or flesh, because John wanted to make sure that his readers understood the very nature this word is taking on. This word, sarx, or flesh, is not just humanity with sinew and skin and bones and teeth. It is much more the idea of a fully human nature with all of the creaturely weaknesses that accompany it. That is human frailty, human weakness, human temptation, human vulnerability. In other words, he had to be made like us in every way possible. Everything that makes a human, human, Jesus Christ possessed. Sin excluded. The temptations we feel, the pain we endure, the heartache we face, Jesus knows because Jesus is fully human. He's not a deified human. He's not a humanified deity. He is fully God and fully man. He is the God man. As the author of Hebrews so wonderfully says it, for we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted. Why? Because he took on human flesh, human nature, everything that makes a human, human. All of which is John's very graphic way to tell us Jesus knows our weakness. He knows the very temptations we face. He knows the human frailty that accompany our days and lives. And he's able to sympathize with us in every single manner, yet without sin. In fact, not only did Jesus take on that human frailty and weakness, but he actually entered into the space, into the location where those things are fully experienced. Notice the word did not just take on flesh, but he took on flesh in order that he may dwell among us. Uh, Literally, he tabernacled. He pitched his tent in the midst of those he had made. Uh, Any Jewish reader looking at John's gospel at this point would read that word dwell there. He dwelt among us and instantly their minds would be transported back to the Old Testament picture of the tabernacle, the place where God had tabernacled among his people in the wilderness. When God entered into a formal theological covenant, that just means an agreement with the nation of Israel, he made this formal agreement. He said, I will be their God and they shall be my people. I will be their God, they shall be my people. And so to seal the deal, God sovereignly places a manifestation of his presence in that portable tent called the tabernacle. Weirdly enough, Moses would refer to that place as the tent of meeting, the place where God and man would meet 
on the earth. But as with all biblical covenants, there were certain requirements, stipulations, and rules that needed to be met because God is holy and we are not. And so the agreement was that inside of that tabernacle, there was the holy room or the holy place where the high priest would go in and sacrifice the the unblemished lamb on behalf of the people so that that lamb would picture, it would prefigure the taking away of our sins and the forgiveness we have in the Lamb of God, the ultimate Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And so inside of that Holy of Holies then was the Ark of the Covenant, the box where the Ten Commandments would rest. But on top of the Ark sat the mercy seat, and that was the very place where God would manifest His presence. He would dwell in the tabernacle. Eventually then, the tabernacle gets replaced with the temple in Jerusalem, and God once again places a manifestation of his presence. But as the story of the Bible goes, humanity once again falls into sinful uh, idolatry and egregious sin, and God removes his presence from the temple, making it impossible for God and man to dwell. 400 years of absolute silence pass by until one day the silence is broken by a prophet in the wilderness. A prophet who is sent by God. That title, hmm, weirdly enough, given by John the Baptist just last week. John the Baptist comes proclaiming the word. The word becomes flesh. He has tabernacled among us, except this time. This time when God comes to dwell, he would not just use a manifestation, a picture of his presence. He would be the very location of God himself, flesh. He would take on all of the properties of a portable human tent wrapped not in goat skin, but in human flesh, human skin, human bones, where humanity had once removed themselves from the presence of God because of their sin. God, in his humility, now decides to presence himself back in amongst sinful humanity. The word became flesh. He has dwelt among us. One last thing before we move out of this section. One could not think of the tabernacle in the wilderness without thinking about the glory that fills the tabernacle in the first place. Uh, Exodus chapter 40 reminds us that the glory of the Lord filled the temple so much so that Moses couldn't even enter into the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it. So not even Moses, right, God's chosen prophet, was able to enter because it was just so thick with the presence of God. And so when John says that, hey, we have seen his glory, well, once again, every Old Testament reader would have been transported back to the book of Exodus, And so John, in this brilliant unification of Old Testament, New Testament, he brings them together and he says, hey, that same glory, that same presence, the same power that was put on display in the wilderness in the days of Moses has now been put on display in the fullness of time, in a much more glorious way through the person and work of Jesus Christ. All of that to say, my dear brothers and sisters, Jesus is a trustworthy picture of the gospel. He is, my friends, the very gospel embodied and the gospel explained. We don't need any other mediators to bring us into God's holy presence because we have seen the glory of the Son who is the temple, who is the priest, who is the sacrificial lamb. Not only does Jesus fill all of the Old Testament promises, prophecies, and prefigurations, Jesus is at the same time the very radiance of God's glory, the exact expression and representation of who the Father is. For in Christ, Colossians 2.9, all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. If you want to see God's face, know his glory, hear God's truth, you go to where the person and work of Jesus Christ are most fully on display. And for us in 2021, that is his word, the Bible. And so to solidify all of these claims that John is making, he, he, he then hearkens us back once again to John 
the Baptist, the witness to this word made flesh. So he says, verse 15, John testified concerning him and exclaimed, this was the one, the light of the world that I was telling you about. This is the one coming after me, ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. In the ancient world, someone's rank, someone's honor, someone's status in society generally was tied to their age and maturity. The older the person, the the greater the honor. The older the person, the greater the rank. So according to this custom, John the Baptist was about uh, six months older than Jesus Christ. And so John the Baptist, technically speaking, should have outranked Jesus Christ because he came before Jesus in time. He was about six months older before Jesus was born. That is until John the Baptist reminds us of what John the Apostle has already told us. The pre-incarnate word who comes after John the Baptist in time ranks before John the Baptist because he existed before time. He existed in eternity past in the bosom of the Father because he was with the Father equal to the Father. The Word is God. And therefore, if that's true, then the glory of the Word is a glory he possessed before time itself. Jesus prays in John 17, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world began. This is an intrinsic glory, a glory that can only come from the one and only Son of God, full of glory, grace, and truth. And by the way, did you catch how impressive John's testimony is here in verse 15? John came testifying. John is testifying. That verb of testifying is in the present tense active. So it's almost as if it's not like John was testifying, but it's almost as if John the Apostle writes decades later, which he does. He writes about maybe 30 years or so, I think, after the time of John the Baptist had long been gone. And yet the verbs he uses is that John is still testifying, even today as I'm writing this 30 years later. So John the Apostle writes decades after John the Baptist, and one preacher has said it's almost as if uh, the old apostle could still hear the words of the Baptist preacher ringing out and thundering across the lands, the king is coming, the king is coming, the king is coming. By the way, John the Baptist wasn't Southern Baptist, not like us kind of Baptist. He was John the Baptizer. We just call him John the Baptist. But still, he's not John the Presbyterian, so let's just keep that in. (laughs) He proclaimed about the glory of the coming king. Oh, dear friends, if you are here this morning and you're just joining us for the first time, we're so glad that you are here. But if you are here this morning and you are not in a right relationship with the king who has come in human flesh, I have to tell you that you are in grave danger of hearing the word of truth found on the pages of of this Bible and still rejecting the word of truth coming under greater condemnation if you were to die here today. See, the truth that we find set forth on the pages of the entire Bible is that each and every person here, we are not good people. We are not intrinsically glorious like this word is. In fact, we are the complete opposite. We are sinful. We are wicked. We are bad people because we've all sinned against the holy God who created us to reflect him in his image. Each and every one of us have not upheld his glory in our lives. We've all uh, stolen from others. We've all hated one another. We've all um, stolen from one another. We've all lied to one another. Each and every one of us deserve nothing less than the full weight and punishment for breaking God's holy law and the sins that we've committed against him. And those who refuse the offer of salvation, the free offer that is found in Jesus Christ, here this morning, the Bible says that we will suffer at the hands of a holy God for all eternity if we reject so great a salvation that's being offered right now. But the good news, the great news, the glorious news of the gospel is that the word has been made flesh 
That Jesus himself has come into the world to take on all of the sin that we have committed against God and that he lays it upon himself at the cross. Jesus is both fully God and fully man. He is the God-man who can live the life we never can, who can die the sinless substitutionary death that we could never die, satisfying that eternal wrath of the Father that our sins had accosted him. And God the Father had killed his son in our place on that Roman cross so that he could be buried, showing us that he really took the punishment for sin, which is death. God raised him three days later, showing himself to be the son of God, vindicating the claims that Jesus is the one and only true monogamous, that is the unique one and only son of God from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so God calls us to receive, to trust, to receive Jesus Christ by faith alone. Nothing we can do, simply grabbing hold of him spiritually by putting your trust in that finished work. You can have the righteous right wrath of the Father averted off of you and onto the Son of God. And you can be seen as 100% guiltless of all of your sin because Jesus has taken the blame. That is why the word is made flesh here in verse 14, dear friends, so that he could go to the cross and be made sin for us. So praise God for men like John the Baptist who fiercely proclaim God's glory, grace, and truth in the face of Jesus Christ. Friends, if, you, if that is a message that is foreign to your heart and you're not trusting in that, please come see me afterwards. Come see someone afterwards, the service. Don't leave here unless you know that you have eternal life in the Son. I wish we could stay in this section of Scripture for, for, for the rest of the sermon, but we must move on for the sake of time. We have a lot of ground to cover in the second half of our sermon. The Word made flesh. No, nope. The greater grace of the gospel. Sorry, I should have... Change that. Verse 16. Indeed, we have all received grace upon grace from his fullness. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So just as John testified about uh, the, the coming light, the grace of God that was coming into the world, the light that was coming, the lamb who takes away the sin, John the apostle says we've received him, we've believed in his name, and he's given us the right to become children of God. And so once again, John uh, brings in the mention of grace and truth in verses 16 and 17. He mentioned those uh, two words in verse 14, grace and truth, the two words that uh, are used to sort of summarize the ministry and the life of Jesus. Now again, I can't go too much into it, but those two words, grace and truth, have their Old Testament roots in the Old Testament, they have, those concepts have Old Testament imagery and roots. Exodus 34, verse 6, uh, God, said, uh, God is said to be abounding in loving kindness and truth. So that expression actually sets the backdrop for uh, the very nature and essence of who God is for his covenant people. And so here comes Jesus, the very word himself, who is abounding in what? Steadfast love and faithfulness or grace and truth. And then right at the center of these verses, 16 and 17, you'll notice John brings in the mention of a man named Moses and the law. Grace and truth, law and Moses, Jesus Christ. What in the world is John trying to tell us? Well, it's always good to start off by the negative, what we don't do when we come to these verses. So let me start by saying what you should not do or conclude when you come to verses 16 uh, and 17. What you don't do is you say, okay, uh, Moses, bad guy, right? Jesus, good guy. That's, that's not the distinction. Uh, Old Testament law, bad. Uh, New Testament grace, good. That's, that's not the distinction that John is making here. Uh, we should come to verse 17 in the same way that we come to verse uh, 14 in that what the Old Testament law prefigured, Jesus Christ has fulfilled. 
He's delivered. What the Old Testament promised, Jesus in the gospel has accomplished. What Moses is the shadow of, Jesus is the fulfillment of. He is the full revelation of everything that the Old Testament law had promised and prefigured. Now watch as this all takes place. Have a look again at verse 16. For from his fullness, the fullness of this word made flesh, we've all received, and here's the hinge verse, grace upon grace. If you are reading from the CSB, grace upon grace. If you're reading from the NIV, Grace in the place of grace already given. It's still not making a whole lot of sense at this point, so let me, let me just get the translation out of the way first. Is it grace upon grace, or is it, as the NIV says, grace in the place of grace that has already been given? And the answer is both, and here's what I mean. In the first sense, we have grace upon grace, and that has the idea of uh, grace followed by more grace, or grace replacing grace, the, this idea of a, a never-ending, cascading waterfall of grace that is sort of being showered out upon us through the gospel in Jesus Christ. Kind of like, uh, think of the waves on the ocean shore. As one wave comes in and washes over us and sort of fizzles out, the next wave is already sort of making its way upon us. It's, it's a grace upon grace, like the stacking up of Christmas presents on Christmas morning. It's just one gift after the next gracious gift, after the next, after the next. It's grace upon grace upon grace. And if that's sort of where uh, John is taking this, then he's saying that because Jesus is the fullness of grace and truth and glory, you and I can't out sin the grace of God. If we have trusted in Jesus, he has made full payment on the cross for our sins. That's good news. Jesus knew what he was getting when he purchased us at the cross. And he gives to us grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. As Han so wonderfully summarized the book of uh, Colossians, Jesus is both fully sufficient and supreme. It's a grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. But in the context of this entire uh, section of the overture, verses 14 to 18, I actually think it is grace in the place of grace already given. That is, out of the fullness of the revelation of Jesus Christ, we've all received fresh grace in the place of previous grace. You say, but I don't get that. How can grace replace grace? How can fresh grace replace former grace? Well, we don't have to guess what he means because he tells us right here in verse 17. Verse 17 interprets verse 16. Out of his fullness, we've all received grace in the place of grace for or because the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So John is saying that the law of Moses was one grace, but the gospel is the greater grace. The previous grace that came through the law of Moses is now replaced by the greater grace of Jesus Christ. You say, how is the law gracious? How is the law of Moses, a gracious thing. Well, the way that I like to think about it is like this. Can you imagine living in the time of Moses and Moses had not written the first five books of the law? Can you imagine what that would be like? What what would we know without Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy? The first five books of the law. How would we know anything about creation? What is marriage? What is sin? What would you know about the human race? How would you explain the brokenness that we feel every single day? What would you know about marriage? Who are the covenant people of God? Who is God? What pleases him? What displeases him? See, all of those things and so much more would be lost without the first five books of the law. And so thanks be to God that he has given us the revelation of his law in human speech, a most gracious 
act on the part of God. Only problem, it wasn't gracious enough. God's law tells us how to live. That's a grace. God's law shows us our need for Jesus. That's a grace. God's law restrains human depravity and sin. That is a grace. But it's not gracious enough because although the law is holy and righteous and good, the human heart that comes into contact with it is most definitely not. Paul tells us this in Romans chapter 7. Although the law was supposed to bring life, it brought only death. Sin ceasing an opportunity through the commandments gives death to our mortal bodies. And so if the law is good, the law is holy and righteous, says Paul in Romans 7. The problem is not with the law. The problem is with our hearts. The law of God is not graceless. It's just not the full fulfillment of everything that is promised. When a human heart comes into contact with God's law, that law produces death. Why? Because the law shows us our hearts. It shows us our sin, not because the law is bad or sinful, but because we are. And so the question that is lingering is, how do we escape the just judgment of God given by the law that exposes our sin and shows us our hearts? By looking, says John, to the greater grace. The grace that fulfills grace. Or fresh grace in the place of previous grace. The greater grace of the gospel has come in the fullness of time through the word made flesh. That's the argument that John is making here. The greater grace of the gospel surpasses the previous grace of the law because what the law could not do, weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh to condemn sin in the flesh. The law of God prefigured God's grace. Jesus uh, fulfilled it. Think of it like this. Moses, right, the law came through Moses came through Moses. So think of it like this. Moses could stand up before the people and say, I have given you the truth. Jesus comes along and says, I am the truth. Everything that Moses spoke about, the sacrificial system, the the, the perfection of the law, the holiness of the law, that's me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The law of God is not graceless. It's just not the fullness of grace we find in Jesus Christ, who is the very embodiment of glory, grace, and truth. You know, it's interesting this week at the pre-preach, one of the um, the pastors asked me, um, and they said, Roy, and they were agreeing with me on this, by the way. They said, if these... uh, 18 verses, this prologue is written to identify, you know, all of the major themes and allusions that's going to be drawn out throughout uh, the gospel, then don't you think it's kind of weird that there's no mention of the cross, the tomb, the resurrection? Now, I won't tell you who, I said, who, who asked that, but I, I did say, yeah, Ben, that's, that's really, um, <laughs> that's kind of weird, isn't it? Had a little bit of a think about it, and, um, and I came back to it, and, and I thought, no, the cross is mentioned right here in these verses. Because glory in the Gospel of John almost always points to the glory of the Son that is displayed in his crucifixion. This is, in fact, the first brick laid in the path to the cross. Because no greater grace, no greater truth, and no greater glory has ever been put on display for human beings to see and to look toward than the cross of Jesus Christ. When God set forth his son as a propitiation, as a a sacrifice in our place to assuage his own righteous wrath, that is where glory, grace, and truth come together. You want to know those things, John is telling us, look to the cross. Look to Jesus on that cross. So with all of that being said, let me reread verses 16 and 17 from the RSV, the Roy Standard Version. (laughs) For from his fullness, 
we have all received grace in the place of grace. For the former grace that was given came through the law of Moses, but the greater grace is given through the person and work of Jesus Christ. This is the good news that John is presenting to us here in these verses, brothers and sisters. Jesus Christ can and has fully paid for our sins if you would behold that glory, that grace and that truth here today. Pledge your allegiance, your life, your trust, everything you are to knowing this word incarnate. And so finally then, John comes to the end of his prologue here and he wraps this up so beautifully. So beautiful are the notes found on these pages. No one has ever seen God, he says. The one and only Son who is himself God and is at the Father's side, he has revealed him. So apparently this word who takes on human flesh, the word given back in verse 1, has an ultimate goal, an ultimate purpose, an ultimate expression when he comes in flesh, and that is to reveal to us the glory of his Father, the glory that he had with his Father in eternity past. And it's so fascinating that uh, on Friday night I began to write down sort of the parallels I saw between verse 1 of John's prologue, verse 18 here in John's prologue, and the similarities are quite amazing. Here's what I discovered in uh, verse 1. John begins this prologue with uh, the eternal and divine Word of God. John finishes the prologue with the eternal and divine Son of God. John finishes, uh, John begins this prologue with the eternal word, who is God. John finishes this prologue with the eternal son, who is God. John begins with the eternal word, who is with God. John finishes this prologue with the eternal son, who is with the Father. We learn back in verse 1, words really do reveal things. And here is Jesus in verse 18, revealing his Father to the world. And so the entire point of these 18 verses is that Jesus Christ is the eternal and divine word who has come to show us who his father is, what his father is like, full of glory, grace, and truth. The author of Hebrews puts it like this, he is the radiance of God's glory, he is the exact representation of his nature. Jesus Christ is to the Father what the rays are to the sun. As the sun beams forth its glorious light onto this world, that Jesus Christ beams forth the glorious glory of the Father. He is nothing less than full deity in bodily form. He is the full revelation of the Father, full of glory, grace, and truth. We often hear the expression, Never meet your idols, never meet your heroes, never meet those you love, because the more you get to know someone, as Danny was telling us this morning, the more unimpressive they start to become. When you meet your idols up close and personal, you you actually start to see that they're not all they're cracked up to be. They're just human. But see, here in verse 18, here in Verse 1, here in John chapter 1, this entire prologue, we see something that is entirely, altogether different when we come to know the person and work of Jesus. The more you get to know this God, the more you get to know this man, Jesus Christ, the more infinitely impressive he becomes for us. And the more you get to know Jesus, the more infinitely glorious and gracious and and truthful he becomes as as he starts to transform our hearts from the inside. While no other human being will ever live up to the expectations you have for them, your expectations of Jesus will always be far out distanced by his performances for you. He is the word made flesh. He is better in every single way, everything our hearts crave and desire. Our hearts are restless until they find rest in this 
eternal word. This is a divine invitation into the fullness of joy, into the fullness of glory, into the fullness of grace and truth. He's the fullness of the Father, the fullness of time, the fullness of love, the fullness of forgiveness. He's the fullness of humanity, the fullness of wine, the fullness of bread, the fullness of water, the fullness of joy, the fullness of glory, the fullness of grace, the fullness of truth. We could go on and on and on. In fact, all the books in the world could not contain the glorious fullness that this word displays, which is exactly what John tells us at the end of his gospel. In every single way, he outdistances himself as the greater grace found in the good news of the gospel. Friends, this is why John's prologue is even written in the Bible, to show you, to inform those of you who have never known this word and to reawaken those of you who once knew but have long since forgotten. Do you know the grace of the Father that is given through the Lord Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are desperate. Desperate to know you. Father, we thank you so much that you have given us, not just the New Testament, but everything of the Old Testament that shows us that you are the God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The same God who graciously delivered his people from the hand of Pharaoh in Egypt. The same God who redeems and rescues his people from the grip of sin and slavery in the Old Testament is the same God who has come in human flesh to deliver your new covenant people through the gospel of Jesus Christ. What all of those Old Testament pictures prefigured, Jesus is the very picture and fulfillment of thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the fundamental message we proclaim as Christians that you set forth your Son to assuage your own righteous wrath, to be the propitiation for our sins so that we may be forgiven because of what Jesus has done. Thank you that we are not bringing unblemished lambs up the front of this church to slaughter on the altar every week, but that Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, has been made sin once for all, for all time, so that we can just rest in the finished work of him. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for John's prologue. Father, continue to challenge and deepen our understanding of it. We love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.